you know, I'd always ask the, the question, you know, the nurses, the doctors, um, most of them, I would say probably were 16, 17, 18 years old. And they decided, Hey, I really want to be a nurse. I, I really want to be a doctor. And this is, this is the career path that I'm going to go on and I'm going to train and study hard on this. And then I'd, I'd ask them, I said, Hey, when you're in your training in, in med school or, or nursing school, how many of you guys had a class on materials management and supply chain? Um, how many of you had a class on um, medical documentation? Nobody raises their hand, you know, but if you ask them what percentage of their day they're doing that, it's a pretty good percentage. What's up, everybody? This is Paul Critchley, president of New England Lean Consulting. Welcome to another episode of the New England Lean Podcast. So lots happening here. If you missed it last week, uh, I took part in Deandra Wardell's uh, blog series entitled The Colors of Love, which is part of her um, Root Cause Racism initiative. So I'm very proud uh, to have been able to take a small part in that. So again, if you missed it, please search hashtag root cause racism. Uh, you can read my blog post as well as several other folks who all share their knowledge and histories and experiences. And to, to be honest with you, I was quite moved by, by several of them. Um, we, it all culminated, we had in a webinar on Thursday which was uh, moderated by my friend Mark Graben and uh, supported by the good friends at Kinexus. So shout out to you guys. Um, but we had, it was amazing uh, webinar. We've really had some, some open dialogue that was based on trust and respect. And it was, again, very moving. So thank you to Deandra Wardell um, for taking that on. You know, this is something that she kind of came up with on her own a long time ago, and she's been running different blog series along the way, and I'm very proud to have been able to take a small part in the last one. So thanks again, Deandra. Likewise, if you haven't yet, please uh, go to leancommunicators.com and check out everybody there. That's another group I'm part of, uh, just podcasters, uh, some of which you're probably familiar with, um, but a lot of good folks sharing good information, thought-provoking, so definitely check that out, or you can just search hashtag Lean Communicators. So let's get to this episode. This week, I'm proud to say we are joined by my good friend, Isaac Mitchell. Now, I've known Isaac for probably six or seven years now. Um, we first met in Portland, Maine. There's a small local or regional uh, Lean uh, conference that's usually every year, obviously, covid mess that all up but uh, uh, it's one of my favorites if not my favorite conference to go to it's very it's just small um, but it's very intimate and you really get to know people so every year when I go back I see some of the same faces and you kind of get caught up and it really feels more like a family so that's where I met Isaac now I'm going to brag about Isaac a little because uh, he won't he's too humble um, so I'm going to do it for him now Isaac's a fellow in the American College of Healthcare Executives. He's a Lean Six Sigma black belt, a project management professional, and a certified professional in healthcare quality. He spent most of his professional career working on continuous improvement in lean. He walks us through, you know, how we got to start, um, so I won't steal all of his thunder there. Um, but he actually was, his undergrad was in industrial engineering, go figure. So he's, he worked in healthcare, uh, for a long, long time, and that's where um, he talks about what he's entitled Cardboard City. And this is a story I've actually heard Isaac tell before, and I love this story. I reference this story when I'm doing training. Um, but this is in this case, on this episode, Isaac goes into much more detail than I've ever heard him go into before. And it really, it makes me, number one, love the story even more than I did before, if that's even possible. But it also brings to the forefront the lean tool of 3P, which stands for Production Preparation Process. And if you haven't heard of that, it's 
I won't say I'm surprised because 3P doesn't get a lot of marquee, you know, like 5S or value stream mapping or that kind of stuff. It doesn't it doesn't get a lot of promotion. Now, I will say for me, it's right up there with setup reduction as one of my absolute favorites. Anytime we get to do this with a client and we've got a couple right now that we're doing, it's amazing and it's an amazing tool and it's well worth the cost and efforts. And as Isaac explains in the story of Cardboard City, you'll see why. So I'll zip it because I don't want to spoil anything. We also talk about technology. So Isaac since moved out of healthcare and he's back in operations and the company he works for uh, really works on technology, but with a lean twist. And I don't mean lean in their plants and factories, which I'm sure they probably do, but it's actually a product to help doctors and nurses be better, you know, sp spend their time more efficiently and doing the things that you want doctors and nurses to be doing. And it's really cool technology, and I'm ashamed to admit I didn't even realize it kind of existed um, so I really enjoyed listening to him tell us about it. So as always, I hope you like it, and I hope you get something out of it. Have a fantastic week, everybody. I appreciate you. We'll talk to you later. All right, welcome to the New England Lean Podcast. I am your host, Paul Critchley, and as I mentioned in the intro, we are welcoming my good friend, Isaac Mitchell. Isaac, how the heck are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me, Paul. Yeah, man, it was good. It's good to see you. You and I haven't hung out in what two and a half years, I guess. Yeah, I think uh, it's been a few years since we've been up to the, the Lean Summit up in Maine. So yeah, I miss hanging out up there. I know, right? It's I love the I miss that. So it's one of my favorite ones, if not my favorite one, just because it's you know it's small and intimate, and mm -hmm. plus it's in the old port of Portland, and it's just a fun place to be. Yeah, it's a great, beautiful city. Lots of fun things to do for sure. Yeah, right. Um, so I get it. you have a really varied background. Uh, so I think I find it very interesting. And, you know, when we when we were hanging out, we kind of get a chance to chat and, and talk about those things. But for those who maybe don't know you, don't follow you, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got involved in lean and what you're up to now? Absolutely. So uh, to be completely honest, I kind of stumbled into my career and into, into my major, um, but it turned out to be a great fit. Um, I went to my undergrad for uh, industrial engineering, um, but didn't know anything about it when I was in high school and uh, had a summer job working in a factory. Uh, I had the honor of cutting out drawstrings and drawstring pajama pants for uh, eight hours a day on a hot <laughs> night. So it was a very exciting job. Uh, but uh, I had an amazing plant manager uh, when I worked there. I was 16 years old and he would always come around on his employees and see how they were doing and really started what I consider to be one of my first mentorships. And it happened to be that he was an industrial engineer and told me about what he did and what his responsibility were and what his career was like. And that's what really got me interested in it. And that's what I decided to uh, pursue that degree. Um, when I was an undergrad at the University of Tennessee, um, had some great teachers there, great mentors. And they're the ones that really introduced me to uh, the Toyota production system. And the Toyota Way, uh, that book, actually, the first edition came out uh, when I was an undergrad and uh, read that book and just became inundated with uh, Lean. And that's where I came on my fixation of uh, this is what I want to do. Um, and my first focus really right out of college was to get a job at Toyota. And uh, that's what I did. So uh, nice. from there, I just kind of uh, progressed in different uh, industries, uh, you know, automotive, uh, machining. Uh, healthcare, and now I'm more into a um, RFID supply chain software development role. So um, all focused around lean, no matter what type of role I was in, I, I've used the tools, the methodologies uh, uh, to, to solve problems and, and uh, hopefully change cultures. Nice. And that's what I love. I love about your story is, you know, you like you started an automotive, you've gone to healthcare, you're kind of back into manufacturing now, but software development, which is, you know, obviously different. Very different um, yeah. But the cool thing, well, I, a cool thing is like you just said, you lean can be applied anywhere. You know, we still get the question sometimes, uh, you know, well, we don't make cars and we're not a high volume shop. We're a job shop. 
So mm-hmm. how do you do this here? Like, it kind of doesn't feel like it fits. And then it's like, no, no, it still does. So let me yeah. kind of show you how. So it's really interesting. Here we are in 2021 now, and there's still, you know, some people who think, eh, you know, maybe they read the Toyota way or machine to change the world or something. They're like, all right, that's kind of a cool idea, but. Uh, I forget, I forget who had the, the joke. The original joke was the Toyota history, you know, uh, Toyota was a uh, part of a, a loom factory and then um, moving that into automotive. I just can't imagine the conversation that we would have. And this will never work in a car factory. You know, this only can work in a loom shop. So uh, the same old question over and over again, but um, you know, I think it applies anywhere. I had lots of, of, of questions from, from friends and colleagues. You know, my current role isn't a traditional lean role. So uh, operations, director of operations role and said, well, are you going to still be doing lean? What, what are you going to do? It's like, of course I'm going to be doing lean. You don't have to be a, a lean coordinator or a consultant to, to practice the principles. It, it's really uh, applicable in any type of role and in application. And I've I tried to bring that into to everything that I do with, with my work. Nice. And you kind of touched on it a little too. It's really culture based. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't know. My opinion is I, the more I've done this, so the longer I've done this, it really comes to that first. And then, you you know, tools are tools and those are great. But if you put them in the hands of an empowered, engaged, respected, trusted workforce, it's like, it's crazy awesome. I just, mm-hmm. you know, and I've, I've had the privilege of being involved in, in some of those and you just sometimes you, I stand back and look, and it's like, holy cow, look at what this team is able, able to do. And then, you, you know, I've had conversations on this podcast before with folks about the hierarchy and command and control. And obviously, you know, pretty much everybody that comes on agrees that that's not the way to do it. But it's still a struggle because um, there's still a lot of folks out there who think, all right, now, now I am the supervisor. I am the manager. I have to maintain control. I have to direct people. I have to tell them what to do, when to do it. Mm-hmm. And it's that, that dichotomy. I don't know what the right word is that it's hard to break that shell and say, there's a whole nother way to do this. And the long-term effects are going to be so much better, but it takes a little bit of a leap of faith. I think sometimes to get there. Absolutely. I think you know, a lot of people start um, learning about lean and their interests, and it's all focused around the tools. But I think the hardest thing for me as I've grown and learned more about lean is how do you how do you act as a lean leader? You know, how do you not have all the answers? How do you create the environment and and coach employees and train them to think uh, uh, in the in this lean manner and approach problem solving and uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that the more you learn about lean, the more you know that you don't know that much about lean. Uh, so it's challenging. And uh, that's kind of the point where I'm at right now, where I'm in this leadership role and I've got a group of great employees under me. How do I teach them these problem solving methodologies and how do I teach them that it's OK to fail and to learn from it? And, and those those some of those tough core concepts. So when you and I first met, gosh, I don't know five years ago, seven, whatever it's been, uh, you were working in healthcare, right? And yeah, so. um, there's a, I actually took one of your workshops uh, up in Portland on one of those times. And there's a story you tell, and the, the part of it I remember most, you called it Cardboard City, um, which I think goes back to 3P, which is a, a, a lean tool I'm a huge fan of. Mm-hmm. And I don't see it mentioned a heck of a lot. We don't, as a lean community, I feel like we don't talk about that very much. Um, but it, again, I, I think it's one, if, if possible, if you have the time and the space, uh, I think it's one of the absolute best tools to be able to use. So I was curious if you, you know, can share that story as much as you can without, you know, revealing Absolutely. too awful much. So um, I've been really fortunate in my career to be in the right place at the right time. Um, and one of those times was at East Tennessee Children's Hospital. Um, and my role there was the, the director of their lean and continuous improvement program. And when I was there, uh, it happened to be at a time when they were more than doubling their hospital capacity uh, through an addition uh, of another tower. So um, I was so excited to be there at that time and get to use several uh, lean methods, including 3P, um, to help really design this new power, which consisted of 
the main areas uh, improvements were a brand new uh, cervical suite and uh, a brand new uh, NICU, a neonatal intensive care unit. And we knew we had this opportunity to really step back, rethink how we did things, how, how the process flow worked, and um, how providers um, interact with the patients and their families to design uh, the space uh, that works for them, uh, you know, the processes that work for them, along with all the support systems that go into uh, healthcare facilities. Um, on a side note, you know, the first thing I noticed when I, when I moved into healthcare, it's amazing all the things that go on behind the scenes that anybody that has worked in healthcare just, just doesn't see or doesn't know about. So uh, it's really just a, you know, its own little city with all support services, uh, power plant, you know, food, nutrition, uh, you know, uh, you know, laboratories, just all the things that go in behind the scenes of, of the actual care um, providing. And this is really our chance to, to understand all those, those flows, how they work together, the timing and uh, put them together. Uh, but one thing we, we did with, with the cardboard city is um, it's great to think, see things on drawings, you know, to draw them out and look at them. But um, it's tough to really understand what that is going to look and, and feel like. Um, and particularly tough for some people that just aren't visual, you know, people that, you know, there are some people that are really talented. They can look at a drawing and see in their head exactly what that's going to look like and feel like. And then there are some that that's just that's really a really challenging thing. And, the, the, the advantage of the cardboard city is we got to build um, one to one full scale mock ups of uh, space and in, in OR uh, surgery, uh, pre post areas, and in the NICU. Um, so we could take um, the people that were going to be working in those areas through the space and really get a look and feel and uh, design of how this is going to work. And it's amazing, you know, just within the first five minutes of seeing the space, the conversation that came and that the improvements that came out of it. Uh, we looked at drawings for months and hadn't heard any suggestions or ideas around how we should make this change. Uh, but the first moment they get in this, this space uh, that's a full scale mock up, you know, the ideas and, and, and the improvement areas or the concerns come out, come out right away. Um, you know, we were really fortunate where, where the building was located, uh, the, the tower. Um, there was lots of warehouse space uh, in that, that kind of district of the city. So we actually rented out an entire warehouse floor and uh, built up that space out of this, this thick cardboard. Um, we took our teams up there and actually let me step back before we did that. We wanted to truly understand what the work looked like today. So we deployed doctors and nurses and we did, you know, the plastic spaghetti diagram tool. Where are you going today? Mm -hmm. uh, things like that. Um, and then um, we took those, those, those tools and then what we want the future state to look like. And we actually ran an, a surgery day in Cardboard City. We took the schedule. We had, you know, the, the patient beds, the, 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 you know, where the, the scheduling board was and took them throughout all the different scenarios that they might see in the OR to see how that would work in the space. And then What's great about that is you're dealing with cardboard here. So if you want to modify the wall, you're not moving gas lines, electrical, drywall. We physically cut some, you know, duct tape and a, and a, and a, a cardboard panel and, and move it exactly where we want it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was really exciting. Um, same thing in the NICU, you know. Uh, a NICU is a really intimate healing space for, for a, 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 a baby and just as importantly, uh, the family and care providers that are there to take care of that child. And uh, that can't go unnoticed. And that's one thing that we changed a lot in that space was we have this excellent setup for our, our, our children and those, those young babies, but we made lots of improvements around the parent space to fit their needs, you know, and making sure they had their space and didn't feel in the way of the providers. Um, so we really separated those two areas and gave them uh, what they needed as parents to take care of those babies, which was just as important as, as the clinical healing as well. So I think the opportunity to see things firsthand, uh, make changes before we, we spend a lot of money on, on you know, facilities, uh, it's just a, a huge opportunity. And I would encourage anyone, you know, it's, it's going to cost, it's going to cost a little money to, to work, rent out this warehouse space and you're going to spend $10,000 on cardboard, you know, <laughs> yeah. which are shocking numbers. But when you think about it, you go into this new space, 
and it works from day one and you're not saying, oh man, this is, this is the worst idea ever. You know, why, why did we think of this? So, uh, right. you know, 10, 10, $20,000 on the front end is going to save you millions of dollars of renovations in the future. So, right. Yeah. No, so, and that's where, like I said, um, you know, not a lot of places get to do stuff like that. And that's why I love that story so much because it shows a, 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 a high level of commitment for, you know, the administration of the hospital to say, yeah, Isaac, we'll, we'll go spend 20 grand on cardboard mm-hmm. to get this right. Yeah. Um, because again, we don't, you know, here, especially here in New England, we have a lot of old mill buildings that, mm-hmm. you know, were uh, next to rivers because, you know, back in the day it was all, you know, water wheel driven and they're usually long and narrow because you'd have a huge tree, you know, that was run down the center that you'd belt drive stuff off of. Right. And that's how we did it. Um, and there, those are still in use. A lot of them are apartments now, but there are still some places that are doing manufacturing in those. And every once in a while, we'll, we'll go into a place like that. And we'll say, oh, you know, and they'll say, well, we need you to help us do some lean, but you know, this is what we got. And in lean terms, it would be monuments, right? So there's a ton of monuments. There was actually one place in Massachusetts that had this old, old machine. I even forget now even what it was. It wasn't a mill or a lathe, um, but it was, it was ugly. I mean, this thing probably weighed uh, 20,000 pounds. I mean, it was old cast iron, greasy, dirty and literally was in the basement of this place. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, this is right smack dab in the middle of our process. And Mm -hmm. we have to go down this freight elevator and do all this stuff. And they're, they, I'm like, well, there's not much you can do unless you want to try to move it. And they're like, literally this thing was put here and the building was built up around it. So it physically can't get out of here. So Mm -hmm. when we leave, whenever that is, uh, we're just going to leave it here. So yeah, great. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, you kind of sparked my uh, my memory on homes. These these objects that you don't think about that you can't move. But one of the biggest things that we learned that would have been a complete nightmare from day one, where you know you build these big towers, and unfortunately there are columns that have to be built in these towers, you know, to hold the, the floors up. And uh, we found that in about I think 20 or 25 percent of the rooms, there was a column in the middle of the head wall, where all the gases and things like that we would push the bed out. And that column caused no issue with a standard, you know, standard uh, pre-post bed. But, uh, you know, I think we're seeing, and a lot of people are seeing that where there are more bariatric surgeries going on, even in, in pediatric facilities, and you'll see also in adult facilities. Once you put a, a bari- bariatric bed in that room, it actually puts the footboard so close to the wall that you had about a, a foot clearance between the wall and the bed. So, again, just little things like that that you catch um, in, in the cardboard city model that we would have gone live and had, you know, 20, 25% of our rooms that we couldn't use for patients for with very answer bed. So it just, it just really goes back to heart, you know, this $20,000 is going to save you hundreds of thousands, if not millions in the future. Right. So let me ask you, so as you were going through, so Stephen Covey, I guess we call that begin with the end in mind, mm-hmm. um, which is, again, I'm a big fan. So that's probably why I gravitate towards this particular tool, but how did the, so, uh, were you working with the architects and the builders of the building and how, had they ever gone through a process like this before? And if not, how did they react to it? Um, the, the, the firm that we chose um, was a great firm to work with architects. Um, they are very open uh, minded and uh, part of the process. Um, and uh, we've had a builder that we'd actually worked with here and uh, it was based in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, that had built the original hospital uh, back in the 60s. So they had been with uh, a good partner and uh, continue to be a huge partner during current innovations at uh, East Tennessee Children's Hospital. But yes, they, they were very heavily involved. You know, uh, one thing that I loved about this architecture firm is um, if you challenge them to do something, uh, they would step up to the plate and do it. Um, we would have meetings uh, after hours in the evening uh, to do this design planning, uh, to not disrupt uh, the clinician's day, because in those meetings, it wasn't architects, administration, and the builders. It was architects, administration, the builders, the uh, health unit coordinator, the uh, environmental service tech, the PCA, the nurse, the anesthesiologist, the uh, you know ENT doctor, uh, chief of surgery. So it was it was everyone in the room that we felt 
was going to be affected by by these changes. And we also had a representative from uh, the Family Advisory Council. So we had patients and families that were frequent visitors in the hospital um, involved with the planning process. And I think that goes back to the commitment of you know, leadership, having the right leadership there. Another thing that I always count on my blessings is we didn't have the struggle at East Tennessee Children's Hospital where we're not going to invest the money and time to pay nurses overtime to stay until, you know, three o'clock to seven o'clock at night to do this design work. It was just, it was okay with them, which was great. Didn't fight that battle. That just shows uh, the importance of having the right leaders and, and the right end goal in mind and understanding the big picture. But, you know, getting back to my point, we would come up with issues in those, those, you know, five o'clock or 5 p.m. sessions. And, uh, you know, the head of anesthesia said, you know, I don't think you're understanding what my day looks like. Uh, I'm going to come to your hotel at 445 in the morning and I want you to shadow me. And this was a lead architect at a huge firm in Boston. Hmm. And he was like, that's great. I'll be there. I'll be ready to go. And he spent the day with the anesthesiologist understanding his flow and what, what he was trying to convey um, and his concern. And I think that's so important that when you're when you're looking for partners and, and architecture firms, you know, yes, it's great that they've done some lean work or, or things like that, but more more importantly to me is that they're willing to be open and learn and not just do the traditional process where the architects draw things out, they get feedback, go back to the board, draw things out, get feedback back and forth. They're actually in the moment seeing it firsthand with our providers and seeing the culture where we're coming from and how we work and how we need them to help design uh, the facility to meet our, our needs. Nice. Nice. And you're right. I mean, there's so often where on a big project like that, it's, it's real easy to be in your own little silo, especially. So this place is up in Boston, right? So I'm an architect. I'm in, right. I'm looking out at, you know, Yawkey way and Fenway. And I'm mm-hmm. like, ah, I'm working on the Tennessee project. So you know, click, 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 here's my solid model and I'll email it to Isaac and I'm on my merry way versus, yeah, I'm, I'll come down and I'll shadow you at, mm-hmm. you know, 5 a.m. and do the whole day with you. And now I understand, I get it. Now I can really put some knowledge into this thing, right? Mm-hmm. Put it on paper. So yeah. this, so, so flash forward, this place, you built this thing, right? This is up and running today. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, it's, it's been up and running, um, going on. Uh, I think almost four years now. Um, so, um, you know, no major redesigns, which is always a, a great, uh, uh, we've heard horror stories where we, uh, people open up units and, and a year later, it's a, it's a complete uh, redesign. Um, I was actually back at the facility. I no longer work there. I started a new role at a different company, but um, my choice, uh, I just want to make sure that's clear. Um, uh, you know, uh, and it, it's, nothing's changed, it's working great. Uh, they're still seeing the improvements with uh, uh, one of our big things is surgery redesign, um, improving um, on-time starts and uh, um, non-value added activities first thing in the morning to get, get patients in the rooms uh, without the extra waste. Um, and we're still seeing the flow there. And it's just great to actually walk back, uh, you know, three years, four years later, and see that 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 uh, people seem overall relatively uh, happy with with the results of, of the uh, the uh, the design. You know, obviously there's always going to be room for improvement, and, and if, if there isn't, then uh, I'm worried that there's something going on with the culture there that they haven't you know continued to to improve uh, the design work and what we've done. But overall, it's, it's always been great to go back and see uh, you know uh, the work that has been done there. And uh, I've got to give a big shout out to, I've, I've had a couple of great uh, lean mentors that helped me through this design process. Uh, this wasn't uh, an, an Isaac Mitchell game. It was uh, a couple of external um, lean mentors, uh, Jennifer Dieter and uh, John Kim. I don't know if you've ever crossed paths with them, but um, you know, they, they were great mentors and, and coaching me through the process and, and helping me learn through myself. And I think that's important for any lean practitioner is to, find uh, mentors in your journey uh, to learn from and um, they've been two um, you know really important mentors um, you know I think we have a mutual friend Mark Raven that's been a great mentor of mine um, um, to learn from people that have done this um, and, and help you in your skills so uh, that's something that I've always been appreciative of, of those folks for helping me with. 
right? I have a, it's something I've mentioned before on this podcast. I had an old manager who had a saying, uh, none of us is as smart as all of us. Mm -hmm. And I, I, to this day, I did Google it and I think it's attributed to an author and I can't remember off the top of my head, but that one's always stuck with me because it, I hadn't, I haven't read that book, but I remember where I was when I heard him say that. Mm -hmm. And it was so profound that we actually all got little plaques for our desk yeah. that had that quote on it. And it's stuck with me all these years. And now it's golly, almost 30 years later um, that to your point, it's like, yeah, you know, I feel like I know lean pretty well, but like you just said a, a few minutes ago, the more you learn about it, the more you realize how much you don't know. Mm -hmm. And it's so important to lean on, you know, and I'm especially grateful for our lean community yes. because anytime we, you know, I, I feel like anytime any of us reach out, there's a, a line of people that are right there ready to, to lend a hand, lend some advice and say, well, we've done that and we did it this way and it worked okay or it didn't really work great. So don't do this, you know, that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Um, and that's what I think that's part of what respect for people really is too. It's, you know, it's, it's so easy to, you know, one of the things I think as lean practitioners, we struggle against is that feeling of, but this is the way we've always done it. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've done it, I've done it this way and it's been successful for me because I can show you my, my career progression. And now mm -hmm. I'm, you know, head honcho, CEO, ops manager, whatever it is. So why would I change that? Because it got me to where I got, you know, and it's that, that, you know, that, uh, the fight between those two thought, you know, thoughts that it's, it's very interesting. And even from a lean perspective, like, um, we had Elizabeth Swan on and, and she and I talked about that because I, I'm guilty of it. Sometimes I'll have a workshop or something that I've done and it's like, okay, check that one's, that one's all set. And sometimes I have to remember that, no, I have to go back. And, you know, that's part of Kaizen is you get feedback from the workshop participants and it, sometimes it can be hard to hear. Like I really hated this part because like I have a lean office training and one of the pieces of feedback I got was, well, you have way too many pictures of dirty desks. It's like, you, you say dirty desk, you show me a picture. I get it. I get it. Yeah. You don't have to show me three more times. And I'm like, think it. And my first reaction was, well, yeah, but I'm trying. And then I caught myself and I'm like, duh, Critchley, you're, you're doing what you're, you tell everybody not to do. And I'm like, don't, you know? So, um, yeah, I can't, I can't agree more, you know, with, with what you're saying here. We, you know, I actually had a, a, uh, just a printout eight and a half by, you know, 11 in my office that says, uh, you know, because we've always done it that way and have a big extra, you know, uh, and just keep that in mind. And uh, we also had, a, I also had a great mentor and a CEO at East Tennessee Pilgrim Hospital. And he had a similar thing in his office just to remind him. Um, and he just said, you know, they might be right. Just to constantly remind him that you need to listen to people uh, out, hear them out, uh, listen to their, where they're coming from. And even though you're the CEO and president of this facility, um, I think he had that as a constant reminder to hear people out. And I thought that was a, another great takeaway from that, that relationship with him and that mentorship with the uh, CEO there. Nice. So you've transitioned now. So, so you're not in healthcare anymore. So what are you up to now? So yes and no, I'm kind of in, in between. I work for a company, uh, DeRoyal Industries, and um, they're really well known for their uh, uh, durable medical equipment products, um, um, disposables, things like that. Um, what made them famous uh, in the 70s, uh, well, they, they were the original inventor of the, uh, uh, the walking boot, the, the reusable walking boot. So um, you know, before you'd have to get uh, a cast and plaster and, and they'd wrap you up and it was a pain, you couldn't, you know, take it off for showers, things like that. And um, our president uh, actually came up with a reasonable walking boot and that's how he started his business. And they continue to grow the business in uh, all types of uh, different medical products. Um, I got really interested in this company uh, because um, they were using... Um, RFID technology, radio frequency identification, uh, to help solve um, some problems in healthcare around uh, supply chain and non-value added uh, activities that they saw with clinicians. Um, 
and um, I've always been interested in, in product design and entrepreneurship, things like that. And that's what really got me interested in this RFID product called uh, Continuum. And we have several products out there, but around every single product is designed not around um, the products itself, but how do we design a solution to free up nursing time? And that's really the focus of, of, of what this, these products are. Um, and that's where my lean background comes in and, and really gets me uh, uh, excited to be a part of this because uh, when I was doing all this work in the operating rooms at, at East Tennessee Children's Hospital, you know, I saw the, the manual steps that they have to do to document usage of, of supplies in the OR, you know, um, uh, either keying in, you know, item numbers, part numbers uh, in the, the EMR, or if it's something with a serial number, lot number expiration, such as an implantable, you know, putting in that huge, uh, I think it's a 26 character long, uh, you know, barcode that has all that information that has to be documented in a patient chart. So a lot of non-value added points to documenting uh, making sure they're charging for the right things. Um, and what this company had innovated around, uh, the Royal, was using uh, RFID um, tags on those products and that contains all that information. And we've designed a um, smart trash can. We call it Oscar, like Oscar the Grouch is green. Um, and all nice. the clinician has to do is throw that, that, that trash in that trash can uh, that trash can uh, interfaces with the hospital EMR and that patient chart, and it documents all of that information without any manual steps and processes uh, to give time back to that clinician to actually uh, take care of the patient, uh, be you know 100% uh, in the moment in the OR and not worried about the paperwork. Um, other things that it does that helps the, the, the hospital side from, from a financial perspective is, yes, we're capturing all of our charges and uh, we're automatically billing for those charges without um, uh, having to do extra paperwork, things like that. So all that, that integration is in there. So, you know, I'm not usually one to say there's a technology silver bullet, but when there is an application like this, and, and when I saw it, when I was looking at this company, that's what got me really excited where there is an instance where technology can really help uh, eliminate some non-value added work and, and make a clinician's uh, day easier, which is a, a, a big thing for me uh, it, from what I've seen in healthcare where at the end of the day, some clinicians want miles and be uh, cashiers and, and materials managers. And, and uh, this is frustrating to see, especially with all the training that they've gone through, you know, anywhere from two to dedicating, you know, 15, 20 years of their life to their trade. And then we're asking them to document things by writing it down. Right. <laughs> you know? So, uh, you know, getting rid of those things are what I'm, I'm passionate about. And, uh, seeing people be able to do their job on, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, without having to do wasteful stuff. Isn't that, so it's, it's, it's not funny, ha ha, yeah. but it's funny when you say it out loud. And this is something that I talk about all the time. Like I'll do a, our, you know, uh, employee engagement workshop. I talk about the Gallup survey polls, which show, you know, 67% of people feel disengaged at work and mm -hmm. three and a half million Americans quit their job every month. And it all comes back to that exact kind of stuff. It's mm -hmm. like, whoa, hang on a second. Uh, I'm a, you know, a, I'm a, whatever. I'm a brain surgeon. I've got all this schooling to do these very intricate, like, you know, I need to have all my focus on what I'm doing right now. And you want me to do what? You want me mm -hmm. to stop what I'm doing and scan this barcode in or type it in or write it? Like, really? And, and I mean, even in a, you know, uh, it's funny cause you know, we'll do time studies a lot of times mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, you know, I made this mistake early on. We don't do this anymore, but early on in my career, we used to say, I used to say, all right, listen, you know, cause sometimes people would be a little, a little squirrely, uh, with me standing behind them with a clipboard and be like, Hey, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah. Oh, okay. You know, or, you know, or, or being on a video camera, they don't may maybe like that. So one of the things that we used, I used to try was, we'll tell you what, um, just I'll leave it with you and you write it down as, you know, as you're doing it. And in like a hundred percent of the time, I'd come back a week or two later and I'd look and it would be blank mm -hmm. and they'd be like, listen, I just, it's not that I didn't want to, but you know, I've got my head buried in this lathe. I'm trying to get this thing set up. 
My boss is yelling at me because the parts are already late and I haven't even started yet. I can't, like, I'm not going to do that. And I could see it certainly in your case, you know, if I'm on the operating table or something, I do not want my doctor to have to stop what he's or she is doing to do it. Hey, that it's like, no, 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 no. So mm -hmm. what well, you just said, use technology to your advantage and mm -hmm. just let it, you know, let it handle the, the, the silly mundane things. So you can get back to doing what you really love to do, what you were yeah. trained to do, what you get paid to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I use the, the phrase when I was, uh, you know, really in my coordinated role in doing workshops and training, uh, you know, I'd always ask the, the question, you know, the nurses, the doctors, um, most of them, I would say probably were 16, 17, 18 years old. And they decided, Hey, I really want to be a nurse. I, I really want to be a doctor. And this is, this is the career path I'm going to go on and I'm going to train and study hard on this. And then I'd, I'd ask them, I said, Hey, when you're in your training in, in med school or, or nursing school, how many of you guys had a class on materials management and supply chain? Um, how many of you had a class on um, medical documentation? Nobody raises their hand, you know, but if you ask them what percentage of their day they're doing that, it's a pretty good percentage, you know? Right. Yep. Uh, and I think that's where as lean practitioners and as even further than that, as, as software developers, as product developers, we need to go back and really focus on the problem we're trying to solve, you know, and how is that helping the, the end user? And that's again, where no matter what job I go into, that lean bug is always going to be in my ear and in my background about what I'm doing. You know, let's not, let's not throw a fancy new EMR on, on a broken process. You know, let's not throw a, a new RFID technology system that interfaces with their, with their current system and, and make it harder on, on them. Let's go out there, understand, their process uh, and develop a solution that is actually going to improve lives. So. Yeah. Cause that's what you're all there to do. Yeah. Right. And that's what, yeah. you know, that's what makes you tick. I mean, I talk about it a lot. I'm a mechanical engineer and only by degree, but because it's how I'm wired in mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, that's, and that's what I love to do. Like mm -hmm. I get a lot of intrinsic value from, from those things. And if a job can provide me the opportunity to do that more often, I'm going to love that job more. I'm mm -hmm. going to stay, which avoids all the cost of turnover and everything else. And it's like, duh, you know, sometimes yeah. we talk about those things and it, sometimes it's, it's interesting to see people's, the light bulb go off and they're like, wow, I never even, I didn't put all those puzzle pieces together. But when you kind of, when you put it like that, it makes a heck of a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So, so nice. So Isaac, we do like to take a little bit of a break uh, in the podcast and play something I like to call the wicked fun part. Okay. You up for that? And I'm up for it, yeah. Hat wicked tip fun. to our- That's Very Northeastern thing right there. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, we, yeah, we keep it regional. Yeah. Uh, so for you, I put together some uh, semi-specific would you rather questions. All right. All right. Let's shoot. Yeah. All right, here we go. Uh, would you rather go into the past and meet your ancestors or go into the future and meet your great, great grandchildren. Uh, future for sure. I'm, I'm a big futuristic, uh, not uh, any type of time travel. Future for sure. I like to see what's, uh, you know, you can look back relatively easy, but you can't, you can't look forward and see what's really going on. So uh, I want, I want to, I want to meet my future, my future uh, family for sure. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Where we're going, we don't need roads. <laughs> exactly. Big back to the future, man. Yeah, right. there now, it is. I didn't that, get it. I gotta, I'm going to adjust my webcam here and see if you see the reference right there. That is a hoverboard up there. So. Is that what I, wow, dude. Yeah. And so. I did not know that was there, but <laughs> that's a riot. <laughs> uh would I you keep the have... unprofessional stuff on the top shelf. So, that, you know. that, hey, you're, this, is my, this is not my Zoom background. This is all real <laughs> stuff back here. So, uh, Would you rather have more time or more money? Uh, time, for sure. Uh, uh, I think that's uh, obviously, you know, when you read more about um, anybody that um, has passed before their time, that's all they ask for, you know, no matter how wealthy they are. So. Uh, more time, no doubt. Yeah. 
that's almost kind of a gimme for yeah. me lean practitioners because yeah. it all kind of comes down to that, I think, right? Yeah. Uh, would you rather have a rewind button or a pause button in life? Ooh, that's good. Huh. I'm gonna go with rewind, and this this will give us a heart back to my uh, my my lean teachers, but the the reflection thing that the Han said, you know, you know, maybe I didn't handle that very well. I could have done this better. So uh, no doubt, a rewind. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Ditto. Same. Uh, would you rather be stuck on a broken ski lift or in a broken elevator? Ski lift, yeah. I think uh, I'll enjoy the view and the, and uh, take in the, uh, the the skiers and seeing uh, everything going on. So, no doubt, ski lift. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, would you rather hear the good news or the bad news first? Um, bad news. Yeah, I want to. I want to go ahead and get that through. So, bad news for sure. Yeah, get it done and over with. <laughs> uh, would you rather be a little late or way too early? Way too early. That's. Uh, uh, you know me, Paul, but anybody that knows my personality, I'm, I'm usually, uh, you know, at least five minutes ahead of time. And if it's a really important meeting, I'll go to extremes or I'll, I'll, I'll drive to the location of the day before to make sure I know what I get there. So <laughs> I, same, I, yeah. uh, you know, I Google maps, if I'm going to a place and it's semi-urban, um, I Google maps like street view, I will go from like the mass pike yeah, and then like I will, so in my head, I've already been there and I know what to look for in the whole, the whole yeah. thing. One of our, uh, one of our ISO consultants, um, he got me, uh, not long ago. He's like, yeah, now, cause uh, we were going to a new client and have, we had a new client meeting and, uh, he pulled into the parking lot and it was like 10 minutes before the meeting. And I was already there mm -hmm. and he got out of his car and he's laughing and I'm like, what, you know, what's going on? And he's like, he goes, I've had to learn with you. If I'm not 15 minutes early, I'm late. Yes. I'm like, well, because you, you know, that. you never know if there's a yeah. car accident or school bus or something, yeah. something. who knows? Uh, I always have to apologize to my work colleagues that I travel with because uh, on the extremes of showing up to the airport, I'm on the, the, the two to three hours before <laughs> takeoff. And I've got other colleagues that are, you know, walking in while they're boarding. So uh, if we're traveling together, I force them into the two hour window. So yes, yeah. it's too, for me, it's just too stressful. Yes. Uh, yeah. I get tense. Uh, would you rather have the ability to see 10 minutes into the future or a hundred years into the future? Mm. I'm going to say 10 minutes. And just because I think I could make some really good decisions seeing 10 minutes in the future over and over again. So that's the more of my entrepreneurial side than anything. So nice. I, yeah, I think I'm me too. I mean, a hundred years, it's like, eh, what can you do about it? But every 10 yeah. minutes, sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Final one. Would you rather be in the zombie apocalypse or a robot apocalypse? Uh, I think robot. I think that would be a a a, a cleaner demise. Would that would be the best way to describe that? <laughs> right. Well, we got to prepare. We know Skynets get self aware. Yeah, Skynets around the corner, right? Yeah. Right. Well, when, when did that actually happen? What was the year in that in that movie? Oh uh, gosh. I'm sure it's passed already. Yeah, I think so. I, yeah. you know, that's a great question. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Well, <laughs> well when we post this, so I'll just say anybody listening, uh, put it in the comments. Yes, the year so we that Skynet went, went, went live. Right, right. <laughs> Self-aware. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, Isaac. So we got a little bit of time left. Is there anything, um, you know, any anything you're really passionate about when it comes to lean or any current projects or things that you're working on that you, you know, wanted to chat about or wanted to share? Uh, I mean, um, I'd say for any lean practitioner, you know, it's great to always uh, share um, your work like we're doing today, or, or if you have a chance to find a mentor or be a mentor, uh, you know, be that person. I know that those things have helped me dramatically in my career. I would encourage anybody to do that as well, uh, no matter what, what level or role you're in, even if you're entry level, I'm sure there's a high school student or a college student that wants to hear from you and uh, vice versa. You know, you might be mid-career and there might be an entry level that wants to hear from you. Uh, so to play that role, you know, uh, one group that I've been involved with since uh, 
college is the uh, Institute of Industrial Engineers. It's, it's kind of the industrial engineering home. And uh, uh, one thing that I've really been a part of is a healthcare specific part of that, that organization, which is the Society for Health Systems. And um, ever since I joined healthcare in, in 2009, I've been a part of that. And it's, it's a great professional networking group um, to be involved with if you are a health systems engineer or, or lean, uh, play a lean role in healthcare. So Society of Health Systems, um, IISE.net, a great organization. And then, you know, we met through a, a regional uh, meeting in, in New England, um, or, or Maine, sorry. Um, and I think getting involved with these, these local um, uh, networking areas is even better. I've, I've had so many great friendships that have come out of that. Um, actually, uh, the two mentors that I mentioned, uh, Jennifer Deer and John Kim, were part of that, that summit. And that's how I got involved, being from Tennessee and the, uh, the New England and uh, the Lean Summit. So. I just think uh, learning from peers, uh, being a part of it has been a huge influence in my career. And I, I would encourage anybody to, to do the same. Nice. Yeah. And, the, you know, it's interesting. I should have asked that because I, I don't know if I ever asked you how you ended up. Because yeah. now that you mentioned it, it's like, yeah, how did a guy from Tennessee wind up in Portland, Maine at this, you know, yeah. lean summit that has a couple hundred people at it? Yeah. Yeah. That was how uh, my mentors were uh, are, lived in the Boston area and they told me about this this summit and uh, we got to present on our work and uh, um, I got to go for a few years, hope to make it back soon uh, post uh, COVID hopefully world um, and uh, be a part of that great network up there. Yeah. Not to mention being in Portland, Maine is a wonderful, fun city. So. Maine, it's the best state in everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I'm biased, obviously. Oh, well, you know. <laughs> okay. Sue me. <laughs> <laughs> so Isaac, if people want to get uh, in touch, um, LinkedIn best way or? Yeah, LinkedIn. Um, my website, um, has more than you want to know about me. It's, uh, Isaac B Mitchell at.com. And, uh, you'll find my LinkedIn profile there. So, uh, I'd love to touch base, uh, chat. Um, I'll occasionally do some, um, some lean networking events. Um, and I'll post those details on my website. Um, I'll do, uh, some book clubs every once in a while, virtual book clubs. Um, 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 so it'd be great uh, for people to join me there. Uh, they're all free. It's just uh, uh, no no sales or anything like that. It's just people getting together and, and talking about lean. So nice. Yeah. All right, and we'll link out to all that, and I'll I'll uh, link out to um, Society of uh, Health Systems as well, mm -hmm. so that way people can in the show notes, so people can easily get to it. Wonderful. I cool. appreciate. It. All right, my man. I will let you go so you can get some work done today. Paul, as always, it's great to talk to you. And, you too. Uh, you too. To I you miss you. I can't wait till we get to hang out in person again. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Isaac, take it easy. Take care. Bye. Hey, everybody. It's Paul. Before I let you go, I just wanted to say thanks again for listening. Um, you've really made doing this podcast a very rewarding experience for me. Uh, I get a lot of messages from, from listeners and you know, everyone has something nice to say, which I very much appreciate. Uh, of course, I'm always open to, you know, uh, feedback on ways we can make it better. I mean, that's Kaizen, after all. And by no stretch do I claim to have got this all figured out. So if there's things that I could do better, please, by all means, uh, feel free to reach out and let me know. And likewise, if there's a somebody that you think would be a great guest, um, also let me know. Um, you know, there's a chance I don't know who those, who those folks are. So if somebody that you can help put us in touch with, you know, somebody you want to learn more about, certainly let me know and I'll reach out uh, to those folks. But um, I hope you find the podcast fun and entertaining, uh, uh, educational, and, and maybe even a little inspirational, I hope. Um, that's really what I'm, I'm going after with this whole thing. So thanks again. And uh, one small ask. Uh, if you don't mind, if you listen, you know, whatever your preferred platform is, if you could just, you know, subscribe, uh, give us five stars on Apple or, or whatever, again, whatever platform you listen to, it just, it, it helps, um, you know, the algorithms like it. So if you could do that for me, I would greatly appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk to you real soon. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>